the title of my talk here is Distributed Data for Better User Experience. And I was actually planning to kind of make a case for why this is even important. And I'll do that a little bit quickly. But I think uh, Dan's talk, and also to extend Luke's talk, really set me up great for this. Um, at a high level, what I'm going to talk about is a lot of the same concepts, trying to tie them all together and share my experience of actually building an app that does this stuff and running it in production for about three years now. So um, you know, this is the, the basic premise, right? An offline web app, what the heck is that? That's an oxymoron, right? Why would you want an offline web app? And isn't everywhere online by now? The, the canonical example used to be, what if somebody wants to access their data on an airplane? But of course, airplanes have Wi-Fi now, and pretty soon they all will, right? So why should you care about that, right? The, the answer is all about user experience, right? High latency makes your app feel bad. And even if a user can't articulate that, they're feeling it subconsciously, and it, it makes them think poorly of you, right? And obviously, anytime you lose the user's work and make them do something again, they hate you, right? And, and they should, because we need to hold ourselves to a really high standard of user experience. So these are both reasons that you might care about having an offline capable application, even if you never think somebody's going to use your application in a submarine. Or, you know, I'm, it's hard, hard, getting harder and harder to come up with a list of places with no internet, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, the reality is that high latency networks that get over provisioned are given, right? We're always going to have occasionally bad networks, and some places have almost always bad networks. And we're always going to have random routers dropping packets and connections getting dropped. And so if that user just filled out their, their beautiful post that they poured their heart out into, and then they hit post, and you just get, what is, what is it that uh, Hacker News says? Expired link? You know, you know that one? Right? That's a really bad feeling. And if you're going to ro be robust against that stuff, um, Ember gives you a lot of the tools you need to be, to be robust, because you have a lot of state in your page. Um, but to take it to the, to the next level, you want to keep that state even across reload. Right? You want to make sure that when they come get their internet connection back tomorrow, they still have that post. And so what I was just, I, before I was just describing avoiding the problems, and this is the, the kind of upsides, right? The upsides are we have the chance now to bring these web technologies into environments where we couldn't do it before, right? We can now compete with all of those rather terrible enterprise package desktop things that their users don't even really like, right? Everybody's seen really poor enterprise-y software. A lot of it has user experience that is decades behind or just was never even considered as it was written. And I think you know, an audience like this, I think we get user experience, right? We've been, that's the kind of apps we build, it's particularly if you're coming from a, cons like a consumer web space, right? You contrast that with the enterprise-y world, and it's just night and day. And, um, so th this is how we get into that space. This is how we bring our technologies, the open web, uh, modern, modern design in, and just really kick butt and clean house. So the raw ingredients of any of the offline app, right? you need to cache the code, you need to store the data. And, I, and I'm saying not cache the data here because I really think that it's not just a cache. Right? It, is, it might be the only copy of that data you have if this is that beautifully composed post that hasn't got to the server yet. Uh, and then you need to synchronize. And th that is, that's all you need to know. It's done. Um, but of course, these things, are each, these things are each challenging. And some of, them are, um, some of them are, I would call, solved problems today. And some are very much not. And that's why um, you know, the Orbit.js talk was a fantastic lead-in, because that's a, a, a really exciting effort to try to, I would love to see the community come together on some of these things. So cache the code, right? This is app cache, application cache. It actually is really widely supported, and it works pretty well. The API gets a really bad rap because it's weird and a little confusing, and there are some real gotchas. Um, but you can make it work, right? And it works all everywhere. And the, the idea of application cache is just that you're going to serve up, um, you know, right on your HTML element, you have an extra property that points out a cache file. And the cache file says, here's all the assets that have to be present for my app to run. And as long as you've got them, you can just boot it up. And so the next time somebody visits, they don't even hit your server. They get it straight out of the cache, and they're up and running. And even if they're online, that's really nice for the experience, because 
if they've got high latency, they're up and running and already using the app before they've even got a response from your server. Um, service Worker is the newer, cooler way to do this, and it is still really just vaporware. Um, there are the very beginnings of APIs getting implemented in things like Chrome Canary. Uh, it's very exciting. There's a link here about somebody has a nice page tracking the progress of it going out, and it's not really there yet. Um, but the difference with Service Worker, it's a, um, you can think of it as basically, it's like a web worker where you have your own thread, but instead of it being controlled by a page, it controls the pages. It's like running your own proxy server right in the person's browser, and it's going to run even before your app runs. So you can do things like intercept every single network request and decide where to serve it from, whether it's a cache, whether it's going to the network, trying to do both at once and race them. Uh, you can do a lot of really cool things. Um, so an example of a gotcha on application cache that I'm going to, uh, well, OK, and here's an example of an application cache file. Um, it's really pretty simple. Um, it's a list of assets. I've highlighted some JavaScript bundles and some CSS bundles here. There's, other, there's images. Um, then there's the network section. And this is basically the list of the URLs that your, your app is going to be allowed to try to hit on the network instead of pulling out of the cache. Um, this is definitely a gotcha. You're going to really want to make sure you have in your test process before you go and push out changes, making sure that your app actually runs in cached mode. Because in cached mode, if you tried to hit a URL not on here and it's not in the cache, it will fail. It won't even try to go to the network. Right? So this is some of the really unfriendly things about the app cache API. Um, and you can have a fallback section as, as shown here below, which is basically and anything that matches my, my images subdirectory here. If I don't have an image available, it's going to map to a generic image. Um, now, I highlighted um, my JavaScript bundles here. This is a, an example of a kind of hard one experience thing of how I deploy my application. Um, I build a, a depths bundle. And you can see these are all fingerprinted in the same way that a Rails asset pipeline would fingerprint them. They're fingerprinted and served up with really long, you know, super long expirations, just like in that model. Uh, in this case, they're, all, they're, they're going into the cache manifest. But then when I go to update one of these files, this, the, the browser would normally go and download the whole set again. But if it's got some of them and their fingerprints haven't changed and my long caching headers cover, I can do basically incremental updates without having to push all the code again. Um, I got a depths bundle, my desktop app bundle, and a worker bundle. And if I was serving this asset, man, this manifest to a, a mobile device, I would serve them a slightly different bundle. Um, now, another gotcha, hard one with experience on app cache, um, is there's, a, there's some fundamental race conditions in the way you might load stuff. This code is going to be kind of hard to follow on the screen. I don't expect you to. I'll just tell you about it. And I put it in the slide so you can read it if you're interested. The, the idea here is that um, you have two well-known URLs that cannot be fingerprinted. You have your actual home page for your app, right, which shouldn't change, obviously, if people are going to come to it. And the cache manifest itself is the same kind of thing. It needs to be always at the same place. That's how you're able to update your, app, your cached application going forward. People who've already cached it are going to hit that cache manifest and see if there's a new one. Um, the problem is, if you've got, if you've got, say, if you want to roll out an update across in a, in a nice, graceful way, and you're going to spin up a new server that's serving new versions of files gracefully while you still have some old files being served up, there's a rate, there's essentially a race condition where somebody pulls down the index.html from the new app and the cache manifest from the old app. And index.html is pointing at files that aren't in the, new, the, 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 the manifest. And it just, boom, dead. It doesn't even boot, right? You're trying to find your, your JavaScript bundle, and it's not there. Uh, so this is an example of a, of a workaround. It's, this is, I call it my little bootloader, because it's this little seed of JavaScript that is served up in the index.html file. It goes off and actually parses the cache manifest, which you can access just like any other file. You just Ajax, Ajax grab it, and you'll grab it out of the, out of the cache you see exactly which JavaScript files you have available, and you go and stick them in the document. So now, uh, so that's done with ca cache the code, right? Now we're going to talk about store the data. And so uh, there are, you know, there's some confusion because there's some overloaded terms. People use the term web storage. They use the term local storage. Um, and the technologies have evolved a lot, right? It's kind of hard to keep up with all of the shifting standards. and uh, things have changed. There are different, different implementations with different versions of different proposed specs all over the place. Here's just the high level of what to know about. So first example is WebSQL. Right? This is SQLite in the browser. Um, it's no longer on a standards track. It's basically considered a dead standard. 
which makes me really sad. That's why there's a frowny face. I really like it. Um, and the, only, the real reason it's not a standard is because nobody came up, there's no second implementation and the, the W3C really wants to have at least two implementations so that they could have a spec that's not just a program. And SQLite is so good, nobody really wanted to write a second one. So we ended up at this impasse. So I'm very sad about that. That said, you, there are still reasons to use it, even in a relatively new app. Um, it's really your, your best bet on, on iOS. Um, up until when iOS 8 ships, you'll finally have an index DB there. But um, it, particularly on mobile, WebSQL is not going away for a while. Uh, and some of the big players use it still. Um, I'm pretty sure like the Gmail mobile app in the browser, uh, like on Android or on iOS, is using this still. Um, so local storage, um, this, is what some, this is what Orbit.js's existing adapter uses. Um, local storage is really well supported. It's actually really nice. It's in most things. Um, and it has a very dead simple key value API. So, you literally have a local storage object on window, and you could access keys on it just like any object. And if you stick things in there, they'll be there again when you, you came back to the page. Uh, that's great. It's super simple. It's synchronous, which is nice because it's easy, but it's a really subtle trap because when you change your mind later and decide you need to go to a bigger database or get some other feature, you realize that you have to rewrite everything to be asynchronous now. And so, my recommendation on local storage is if you're going to use it, that's great, but wrap it in an async API from the beginning so that you have that ability in the future. Uh, it also doesn't really grow that big. Uh, everybody, the, the standard, the spec, the proposed spec basically just says something like five megabytes is probably a reasonable standard, and so everybody just implemented it that way. And there's actually not really any good support for reliably increasing that quota. So a lot of browsers just have a hard five megabyte limit, which is actually worse than it sounds because it's, uh, it's UTF-16 UTF text, so you really get 2.5 million characters. Uh, it's surprisingly easy to run out of, right? Um, so because it's right, this is persistent state. And unless you're actively cleaning it up, you're using it. Uh, so IndexedDB is the kind of champion of the standards now. Um, it is getting to be well supported. You can see, I don't know how well you can see, but it is finally hitting iOS uh, with 8 when 8 ships. That was the real hole. That was the biggest hole here, in my opinion. I mean, it's still partial support on IE 10.11. Um, IndexedDB is OK. It, it's, it's, uh, I like to have SQL better. I'm, and that's, you know, I'm gonna, actually, I'll get into the whole you know, relational NoSQL wars and all that in a bit. But IndexedDB is fine. It, it has a kind of weird API, too. Um, the, the, one of the big upsides here is that it, it, can, it can actually store a lot of data. Um, there are reasonably good implementations, like Firefox will just let you store things up to about 50 megabytes, then it'll ask the user, and then they can store pretty much whatever. Chrome will just basically, basically let, let you use some percentage of the hard drive. So it's actually pretty robust. Um, and the file system API is the last one I'm going to call out. Uh, this is you know, to literally have a sandboxed file system that you can treat as, as a file system. It is available in basically in Chrome and Opera and not too much else yet. Um, it'll be very powerful when it is, but it's, it's, a, it's a future one. So, so that, ta that takes care of the store the data piece, right? Uh, and I, I hinted b briefly on this kind of objects versus relational debate. Right? And it is something that is, it goes way back. It's not just like the more recent years, NoSQL databases versus those old school relational databases. This debate goes back like, easily 20, 30 years if you go look at the literature. People, even before the relational databases were big, people thought object databases were going to be the big thing. And it has swung back and forth multiple times. And um, I bring this up because I have found, in, in my experience of running a distributed Ember app uh, for a while now, that I, I find myself reaching for the relational concepts and really liking it and, and regretting it when I don't. And uh, to, to highlight what I mean when I say relational concepts, it, this S, relational doesn't really mean just SQL, right? And I think that's part of what turns people off about it. SQL is actually a really kind of terrible API in the sense that you get to call one function, execute, and you get to pass one big string. And that string is very opaque to you once you've built it. Um, the real strength of the relational model as it's intended to be used 
And, um, and you can see hints of this in examples like ARel that Rails now builds Active Record on, uh, although I won't call ARel a perfect implementation of it. The goal is really that it's, it's composable and abstractable. So that when you have, if you say join two tables in your, in your programming environment, you're getting some, some object back that represents that new relation. That new relation should be completely drop in replacement for any of the original tables, right? Composable, abstractable. You shouldn't have to worry about what goes on inside. And once you have that, you can use these now as a way to, to help manage your complex distributed data. Um, one of the challenges of the architectures of both um, Ember Data, Orbit, right, a lot of the filtering they can do is based on in-memory objects. And so if your object set is growing much bigger than that, they're either just delegating that whole problem to a server, which you might not have if you're offline, um, or they're trying to load it all into memory. And um, the, you know, with, with a good relational system, that I, I, and I've built some of this, and I would love to, to work with people on trying to open source it if I can get enough you know, cases where, I, where you can see how it fits everybody's cases. Um, you can do these, th these real query, this real query filtering against a database right on the client, um, or even against index DBs on the client. So um, this is intended kind of as a, as a call to arms and an idea to throw out there for, for all those people who are interested in, in projects like Orbit. Um, so then synchronize, right? And this gets to the, the really nitty gritty. Um, this could definitely be a whole talk. This could definitely be a bunch of PhD theses. Uh, this is really where my overall, my overall recommendation is to stand on the so shoulders of giants, right? We aren't the first to address the data synchronization problem. I think the, the challenge of doing it in the browser environment has a lot of neat twists. And it makes it a, a really cool problem. And the potential is so great because the open web is such a great platform. Um, but the, there's an awful lot of experience in, in older systems and just other ideas and, 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 in, uh, and even in existing open source systems in other languages and other, plat and other technologies uh, to look at. And so here's, you know, here's a couple th of, of examples. So um, you know, the first basic thought is that you really absolutely, you're going to have to fork and merge state. There's, the only alternative is to hard synchronize, which basically means don't do anything unless you can confirm with the server that it's OK. So if you're going to have an offline app, you're going to have your state. Your state is going to fork and diverge. And so merging it is just, it's got to happen, right? And so the whole question becomes, how do you do that easily without making a mess, without uh, diverging the state of your, of your nodes? So the model I'm actually using and have been using successfully for a while now in production is a very Git-like model. So we're, we're literally building a directed acyclic graph of changes and syncing that whole graph among the, among the particular sets of clients that care about that shared data. And um, I like that model. I think it's, um, it's actually quite understandable. You know, Git gets a bad rap because it's definitely got a, a, a weird learning curve in its API surface as a tool. But as a model, it's actually quite elegant. And um, if you're not familiar with the way that commits and trees and all interrelate, check it out because there's a lot of good inspirations there. Um, Downside is it's very hard to be picky about which data you're going to get. And so um, much like you know, only very recent versions of Git let you be truly a first class citizen if you have a shallow copy of, of the history, it's the same kind of problem here. But once you have the history, any two clients can actually synchronize each other. There's, not, uh, there's no privileged position in the network. And that's actually a really powerful thing. You know, even whenever you hear uh, you know, the server is the source of truth, be suspicious, right? Because there will come a day when, you've, when there's zero servers up, or two servers up, or more, and they aren't going to agree, right? So something like a dirty bit on a record isn't really a Boolean, right? It's, at best, it's like a vector. And so uh, these, these problems, they seem like corner cases until they're not, and they're biting you, right? And they do, these things do happen, especially if you reach any kind of level of success and have a bunch of users. These corner cases will happen every day. Um, because the web is just like that, right? People come and they go, and they do it in the middle of things, and networks go up and down. Um, so uh, we already heard about operational transforms from Luke. And share, I linked to ShareJS as well here. That's a really nice model. Um, the, the strength of ShareJS is when you're using it in a kind of a live streaming mode, and you're getting um, two people collaborating very closely together and not stomping on each other in bad ways. Um, 
it's the size of the stuff that you're going to ship ends up being proportional to the, to the operations done. So, you know, there comes a point where it's not optimal if what you're going to do is be disconnected and do a whole lot of stuff and then reconnect and try to boom, munge it all together. It's, uh, it's much more optimal in the case where you're trickling in changes, um, which is the case you hope to be in most of the time. Um, but so trade-offs, right? Um, convergent replicated data types are kind of a hot thing in some academic circles right now and even in, in use, right? React, React is one of the big uh, proponents of these in, in production use. Um, Chris Mickeljohn of, of, of Basho uh, gave a EmberConf talk on them. I, um, after his talk, I was very excited. I read all the papers he referenced and I came away um, thinking they've got promise but I don't see them solving my problem yet. The downsides that we would need to solve really come down to all these papers kind of say, you can garbage collect this data structure. It's clearly obvious that you can do it. You know, exercise left for the reader. Uh, and so I, and, it, and it, there's a valid reason they're doing that. They're focused, these, the people writing the papers are focused on a different aspect of the problem. But as a practical engineer, you can't let your data structure grow forever, right? Um, especially when you just can't predict what your users are going to do. And maybe one of them is going to decide to generate a thousand changes all at once on you. Uh, so I think they have potential, but I think right now they make a lot more sense in kind of in a back end cluster of machines all being distributed, not a thousand clients all being distributed. Uh, and the final thing on my list here is causality tracking. And um, if you, you know, the most widely understood version of this is called vector clocks, which you may know. Um, vector clocks aren't really a great match for the web case either because your clients are churning. And so in a vector clock, you basically have an array that has a place for every machine that might be editing the data. And so when a new machine shows up, you've got to grow that array. And when they go away, you don't necessarily know they went away, right? You now they've just kind of grown your vector. And so um, there are generalizations of that that are a little more dynamic. And um, one of them is called interval tree clocks, and I've implemented it, and it's linked to here. It's something I haven't used yet in, in production use. Um, I think I might pretty soon. It's, um, so the big benefit of causality tracking is that you could think of it as, imagine it as a timestamp, right? But it's a timestamp that um, is immune to the clock skews that are necessarily going to happen. You can't actually just use real world timestamps to, to maintain the consistency of your system or one client with a bad clock will screw it all up, right? So in a causality tracking system, you're actually uh, able to, to prove that a certain change is in, the, is in the causal history of another change. And if, if that sounds kind of like relativity and light cones, that actually was a conscious decision when uh, Leslie Lamport was inventing all that stuff. Um, he calls the distributed algorithms more of a physics problem than a design problem. So, so synchronization is really the hard nut in this three-part uh, challenge I laid out. And so this is partly kind of a rally to try to say, hey, if you're, in the, if you're interested in building this stuff and coming up with really good tools that'll bring this kind of capability to the whole Ember community, I would love to talk with you about it. And uh, let's see what we can build. There's a few Ember-specific patterns I have here in terms of once you have an offline app and it's an Ember app, things that you would want to consider doing. Right? You're going to want some kind of global state indications. This is where things like you know, Gmail will tell you, you don't have a connection right now. I'm trying again in 30 seconds. Um, these, these are just obviously really nice to have for your users. Otherwise, it's not obvious to them always what's going on. Uh, in Ember, it's really easy to do. Right? You're going to have a part of your view hi hierarchy somewhere relatively high up in the application template or some child of it um, that is just bound to properties that go directly through to, through to whatever your store is or you know, whatever that asynchronous process is that's handling the synchronization we just talked about, it's going it's to have some kind of state, right? It's going to know when's the last time I heard from the server, do I have changes I haven't pushed yet, those kind of things that are really good for the user to know. Um, nest, Ember's, ne Ember's nested routes along with error routes are really good for helping you cover the case where um, you may or may not have the data already cached, the person's offline, and they go to jump to some record that you didn't cache yet, right? And, um, you know, if you just have one global error route, they're you know, like the model hook's not going to load and you're going to get just an error and it doesn't mean anything. But if you have a, a, ne a nicely nested error route that just covers the part of your app that isn't, 
that isn't available, um, you can do a you could really gracefully say like, hey, sorry, you're offline. Try to get online. I don't happen to have that record. And then they go jump to the next record, and it's there because they happen to cache that one. Um, checkout to edit here is uh, it actually dovetails pretty nicely with some of, some of the things that Luke said. Um, it's also uh, if if you've ever taken a look at um, Ember Persistence Framework, they have a, an idea called the child sessions. Uh, in Orbit, you know, um, Dan talked about basically duplicating a store. All of these are really motivated by a user experience case that is very, very common, which is uh, m a lot of the time you really want to just make your edits as a user uh, without being like bombarded by other changes, right? And it's actually easier to kind of just get, maybe you get hinted that there's changes there and you can choose to deal with them when you're ready to deal with them, but it's not like you're typing in the form field and then somebody else wipes it out, right? So you don't, Ember gives, a, Ember actually makes it almost easier to do the hyperbound thing where that's the problem. Um, you, it's nice to, to have that separation and to give users a choice about saying when to save and when not to save and when to deal with merges. And finally, authentication, right? In any Ember app, there are patterns we use for authentication in terms of maybe having a mix in that goes into all of our routes so that everything other than, you know, anything that needs to be, for, needs to be a logged in user, you're going to be able to check, do they have a session? If not, let's boot them to a friendly login page rather than just break. Um, that same pattern applies with an offline app with a couple of additional caveats and, and possibilities. Um, for one thing, the, if, the, if that login page is a server, it might not be there, right? And so if uh, maybe you don't care if what you've got is you know, packaged up as kind of a mobile app and you expect it to, to be one user who's going to stay logged in and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to trash their session, that's the easy case. Um, if on the other hand, your, your app's going to want things like a timed logout or uh, the ability to switch users at arbitrary times, you might need to do that when there's not a server around. And that can be done. It has security trade-offs. You know, the idea is basically that once, once a particular user has logged in on a device, you're going to basically have, you know, authentication info for that user there, right? Basically a hashed password. Um, now, I, I, if, if there's any cryptographers in the room, their stomach just dropped, and, and they, I felt like 10, 10 points in their estimation because, you know, crypto in the browser is evil. Um, it depends on, it really depends on your situation. It's certainly not going to, uh, you know, you shouldn't want, wouldn't want to keep secrets in the browser that you're trying to keep from the server, which is usually the common case. But in this case, uh, it can work. And, and I, um, I actually use patterns like this in my app because my users, uh, they tend to, you know, so my application is, is health-related records application used in places like nursing homes. And so they have, you know, something like the iPad that gets passed around by whichever nurse is working the, the given floor, right? And so if the network is down, and they show up and need to log in to go figure out what meds people are taking, it needs to work, right? So that's the trade-off there. And, and you can make that work. So you're basically implementing a login screen that's an Ember view that is backed by the database. It's all completely autonomous. Taking, so this is taking the autonomous app idea to the extreme. Um, and then you'd be able to basically, in the background, after they've authenticated, go in and also authenticate them to the server, right? See if you can establish a session. That's also a useful pattern, which is don't try the online first and then fall back because they might be waiting a really long time. You know, networks don't always fail nicely. Sometimes they fail in a long, slow, painful death, and they might like get a, a minute-long timeout before you fall to your back to your offline mode. Assume offline and gracefully upgrade. Um, so. So all of this is the kind of promises and perils of a stateful app, a stateful client. Stateful clients can be great, but of course they can be statefully broken. Right? That is a huge deal if you're used to, you know, refresh clears all sins. Right? That doesn't happen anymore if you manage to get their local state into a broken place. And so the ability to debug clients remotely is at a real premium when you're in this kind of situation. Um, so I, in my app, you know, I've gradually built up. Why am I not seeing my actual thing running? Am I really offline? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. So I had a screencast. Oh well, no, so my my cursor's there. I don't know. My screencast is only showing the cursor. Well, I was going to show my really cool debugging tool. 
And I'll just make you imagine it. And you'll imagine it even cooler than it really is. But you know, I have a, sec a separate Ember app just for me to go debug my clients. And I can see in real time bound views, who's connected, what route are they in. If they hit an exception, their little, their little row flashes and rings an annoying bell. We can click on them, and it brings up a shell right in there that's running JavaScript right in their browser. So I can go and immediately interact with their database and see what's wrong in it. And um, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, would be great if it was packaged up as something off the shelf they use. It touches so many pieces of the server, and it's so tightly integrated with my security model that it's not easy to kind of make into a library yet. Uh, it would be cool if it was, and somebody should build that. Um, but keep those things in mind. So remote debugging capabilities are an absolute must if you're going to go to the, this model. And so um, capping off just you know, why in the big picture, right? This is, the, this is our opportunity to push the web and open technologies into these new venues. This is our chance to help lead the next swing back toward decentralized web, back toward open, open systems away from closed gardens. I think that smart clients, smart web-based clients, are an awesome way to do that. You know, nothing is more distributed than a system that runs on all the clients, right? You can imagine, you know, what would a, what would a distributed Facebook killer look like, right? It's a weird thing to think about. I think if you're going to pull it off, it's probably going to be really distributed, right? Who else is going to run all that infrastructure as just some newcomer? Um, and truly peer-to-peer -peer web apps are actually becoming possible already. Um, I linked here to a demo, or it's actually kind of a product already, uh, that somebody's put together using WebRTC data channels to directly share data browser to browser, not through the server, right? Think about what that means, right? If, this is another reason to keep, the, keep your eye on the ball of being using truly distributed models where there's no privileged position in the network. It's not, you're not making an assumption that there's one server, right? And it's special. Um, if the server is just a super node, uh, you might get this peer to peer syncing stuff going really nicely. And I think that's an inspiring goal for the future. So it's over. Questions, questions, yeah. Questions, questions. This one on? Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering uh, why use the application cache as opposed to just cache headers? As, as opposed to the regular cache, regular browser cache? Yeah, sure. well, so the, the nice thing about the app cache is that the browser won't, on its own, decide to flush it. Um, you, aren't, you don't really get that guarantee with normal browser caching. Normal browser caching is awesome, and really neat. if you don't know much about it, learn it, because it helps a lot um, in a variety of ways. And it interacts with all this stuff I'm talking about. But app cache uh, is, is better in that sense. It means you're only going to lose your app if the, if the user actually goes into, digs into their settings and decides to delete it. Whereas regular cached stuff, even if you cached it for n years, if the browser decides it's not recently used and that it's running out of space, it will just flush it. Right? So that's, that's the biggest reason not to rely on just the regular cache. Anybody else? OK. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.